So with Night of the 10,000 Meter PVs coming up then, what are you going to make of the event and what it does to athletics compared to, I guess, the more traditional championships, diamond leagues that you get? Because obviously Night of the 10,000 Meter PVs is off track as well as on it as well. Yeah, I think the uniqueness of the event is, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of unique things to it, but the fact it's free to get in to such a, an incredible event straight off the bat is amazing. I think it's one of those events where uh, the, <laughs> just as we get a police car, um, it's as much about, there is a lot of effort put into the spectators and their experience as well as the athletes and giving the athletes the opportunity to run quick. And I think that's, uh, they, they, it's, it's the most unique event in the world that, that really tries to bring that interactive, uh, immersive atmosphere for spectators and to feel part of it. I mean, to the point where, you know, if I'm, when I've raced in the past and friends that have come to the event just because they know they're going to be able to give me abuse and they know I'll hear it and they're not sending so many rows towards the back so uh, but it's it's there's something for everyone it's what you make of it it's what you make it sorry um, um, and there's so much so much to offer I mean my brain's spinning with lots of different things and I could go off on a lot of different ta tangents but I, I feel like because um, I've been interviewed a fair bit this week over it and I'm trying to pick pieces but another one would be for athletes running in across all events, they're getting to experience what it's like for for me when I ran 2012 Olympics. The, the, the noise and the, and the atmosphere there was incredible. And in a small in a smaller environment but in a, in a just as intense way. Well it's intimate, isn't it? You're up close. Exactly. And I think that's a unique thing that it's not exclusive for elite athletes, it's for athletes across all the events to experience the intenseness of what racing can be like of that noise of people in your face and I think that's a brilliant thing to experience for everyone. I was about to say you, you compare that to London 2012 in a, in a mm. way then is there any kind of other event that you could compare not the 10,000 metres of PB to in terms of atmosphere I guess the London Marathon being one as well where does it rank in terms of noise and enjoyment you know for an athlete? So I think I think um so again, the way I described it to someone earlier in the week, I'd say like 2012 will always be that when I stepped out onto the track for the first time and that noise and the atmosphere and the smell and everything of that moment, just my hairs just stood on end and it was just so intense. But but it was following the lead pack and I wasn't having a great day, so I was almost off the back, kind of in my own little world, just watching the race go go by but Highgate the thing with Highgate it gets you to your very core and the reason it gets you to your core is because people are screaming and they're screaming right next to your ear I mean you're not there's not like 10 20 meters between you and the noise you it is right there and it gets you right in your stomach and I love it and also you have to try and find a way to stay calm to perform but it's if you can embrace that and wave your emotion with the wave of the uh, the cheers of the race it, it's an incredible feeling and i think um it's i don't i certainly don't want to c compare to the point where it's 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 it's, it's it's a feeling like or racing in that environment is unlike anything else and that's what again makes it special um and so it's, how do you mentally kind of get into that kind of process and mindset for something like that um <laughs> it's hard to if you it's hard to when you've never done it before to be able to just walk into that arena and just and feel at, you know at home uh, because it, it's it takes a, a little bit of adjustment i remember my first one in 2014 i had to get a little bit used to well this is new this is intense um and it was about trying to so the way i did it was after a few a few laps i started to realize that that consistency of noise kind of waved with the lap so you yeah. had your rowdier bunch and your slightly uh, uh, you know the, the more different types of volume of, of cheering and i was able to kind of anticipate and work with that as I went around the track so it wasn't like you weren't constantly getting adrenaline spikes I almost knew as I come around the bend I remember 
I think it was just before the 300 meter point of a lap, there was a very a very rowdy bunch at that time and they were giving me a lot of abuse uh, about not going to the front and it was all to do with the fact I had the time and Andy and um, Johnny Miller didn't and uh, I wasn't pulling my weight and it was very pantomime-y. Um, but I was able to, once I got a few laps in, I was able to work with those emotions because I could sort of feel what the, what was going on and I'm, I'm a very much a rhythm runner and I'm very much a very, I like laps or even like when we did one of the Kew Gardens and it was two miles, I got into the rhythm of what the two mile loop was like and that's with Highgate, you, you've got the tent which is loud and intense but you can, after a few laps you can get into the rhythm of what that feels like and ride it like an elevator each lap along with the other sections and so I think if an athlete's never run it they need to give themselves two or three laps at the beginning to kind of feel it out and if you know if you if you have run it before then you can be a bit more open to the fact you know give it a mile and i will calm down <laughs> but the thing is there are athletes as well like from all over the world i think we counted some of the countries earlier on i mean you've got countries who uh you know from, from africa south america central america there mm -hmm. you know japan uh athletes are going there not just to you know race in a really good atmosphere but actually to nail that kind of olympic kind of world qualifying standards mm -hmm. as yeah. well what kind of pressure does that put on athletes kind of in that atmosphere as well, the potential to, you know, get something ticked off that list. I think, I mean, when you when you've got a an outcome you're searching for as an athlete, there's a, that's going to be personal pressure and stress that you're going to put on yourself. I think uh, with with Highgate, it's an environment for an athlete to perform well, and it's how it's all about how you use that. I mean, if you enter a track and there's literally no one there other than someone and a stopwatch, and you've got to try and run whatever it is 2710 to make the Olympics you've got to find a way to function and make yourself work well in that environment this is very different this is a very intense a lot of cheering a lot of uh, there's pacemakers there's lights there's all kinds of things and they're all there for you to try and find a way to make them work for you and I think these athletes are, are coming have come and will continue to come from all over the world will see this an opportunity to go you know what if I turn up there's a lot of advantages to this event to help me get the best out of myself. Yeah. And I think that's where, uh, I don't think the event, if they don't want to be just seen as a come here and just party. We want to be seen as one of the fastest races out there as well. When people think of fast 10Ks, they think of Highgate. When people think of a fun atmosphere, they think of Highgate. And it's not just exclusively all about just great atmosphere and enjoy the feeling. It's We've got. I mean, the time, the winning yeah. times historically have been quick, and I think it will continue to. So, for yourself, then, what are your expectations, kind of ahead of? Ahead of take, the take, take the. At the moment, it's race number three or four. Um, it's the twenty nine fifty group. I want. It, I'll take them as far as I can. I've. I, I raced a couple of days ago, so and I've. Bristol off, to Bristol ten k. Yeah, yeah. And I woke up yesterday feeling a bit groggy um, I feel a bit better today so hopefully come the weekend I'm fine and then I will go as far as I can I mean they, they want I think they want all the pacemakers to try and go at least five and anything else is a bonus and I will yeah I'll take them as far as I can so firstly, how's the reaction been for you since you know London Marathon and the response you know the interview that you had with us in yeah. in the mix zone afterwards where you broke down yeah. kind of like from that then you did Birmingham and Bristol and, and mm. got some pretty good times in there as well you know won both of those events yeah how's that you know you said you know to, to pun a phrase being on it earlier on mm. like how's it been for you it's been it's been a really pleasing happy past three weeks to be honest I mean last year was a real just real downer for many different reasons which I don't need to go into all of them for not getting to the world champs and getting ill at certain points and not getting to race certain races I mean all the challenges like you face with your lifestyle change in the background and I think at the turn of this year I kind of put London Marathon as a, a bit of a, 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 a real stake in the sand to go put the last 12 15 months behind me and get myself back going again and I, and I put a lot of um, made some a lot of sacrifices that athletes have to do to try and make London a decent run 
and uh, I was, yeah, it was really pleasing to have to have done as well as I did with the circumstances and a lot of emotion came out as you as you say yeah, afterwards. Yeah. I, I felt, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I'm getting old and so you do, I think a lot of people as they get older say they get more emotional and especially when you start having children they bring out a, a, a real, bring the barriers come down a little bit with that and I think um, to, to do that and be healthy going in, the, the, these last few races show that I went into it healthy and I've come out of it healthy and I know I've got a bit of something now but it, that's fine that's the nature of kiddies and I'm just really pleased to kind of erase the past period and I think that's what sport actually is you're constantly just erasing bad periods and I feel like I've done that now I was about to say you were quite vocal about you know the impact of the shoes for example kind of mm. what that gives you in terms of not just racing but Mm. recovery mm. as well like what's the impact that on has had for you but also on in terms of it's not just like the 10,000 meter pbs it's the series of you know uh la paris vienna melbourne mm. and we talk about kind of how to grow and innovate this sport to you know mm. in a digital age where you know f1 has tried to survive mm. uh you know golf and tennis and you know behind the scenes documentaries as well and actually making it not just an, an event but actually part of a a global series on that as well yeah there's a lot of questions in there yeah, there, are, there, there, was, there, yeah. <laughs> there was there was shoes and there was uh, growing the sport i think yeah i think i think it kind of i think this kind of where my brain's going ties them both in i think when, when i joined on back in 2016 from the work from the very beginning um it was a very different relationship to what i'd had in the past with being an athlete and being sponsored it was very much a, uh you know what do you think and having me more involved in the company in a the direction it should go with with the foot primarily with footwear and how footwear was changing with with uh the carbon and the and the foam and it was because uh, I was their first like track and field road athlete at the time because it was very uh, triathlon based and that has continued as well it's not just been a case of, of you know are we not including athletes it's just that constantly evolving of we want to invest in the athletes invest in the sport and that's what's been really exciting for me that, that to be able to all these years of running, all these years of experience, I'm able to kind of help in some small way help uh, with shoe technology, but also um, how brands, I mean, historically have and continue to have an impact in the sport to make it big, like Highgate and with what Honor doing and then, and the series that they're they're getting behind. I think it's it, it goes beyond just we just sponsor people it's we see you as part of the family and i think that sounds really corny but i think that's just the way the world is now I but think making that, an impact and the sport yeah. beyond just a, yeah, a shoe because, and a, an athlete because it because i think for a long time i think it would be fair to say athletes were probably seen as a bit of a small window of a commodity to get on the back of performance and be like right you've done your bit thank you and whichever brand it was would continue to do their thing and look for the next big thing whereas an athlete is always an athlete and an athlete's assets may change and they might not be winning every event but it doesn't mean they don't have the skills or knowledge or something to to continue to help and i think that's where it's that's where it's been really nice and refreshing to be able to feel like i can um because I mean, let's be honest, my DNA is distance running. That's just, I've, I've tried to fight it. <laughs> I've tried to play a lot of golf, but it's just, I'm just not as good. <laughs> about that, you know, like the advice for someone like Verity Ockenden, who we were chatting to earlier in, in the week, mm. you know, she was praising you about some of the advice that she's given you. Like, how do you kind of reflect? I've given her. Oh, both yeah, ways, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how do you reflect on that and also kind of where you are at, you know, your age now and being able to give that advice to other athletes? Yeah, again, it's something that, that I feel, I've always felt very, I've probably given advice even if people don't want to hear it. Sometimes an athlete's thing, oh, just go away, you're too old to know. And it's and that's fine. I think. I think it was something when I was a young athlete, I, I, it meant a lot when 
successful big named athletes made an effort with me and it stuck in my brain and it, likewise if they didn't it stuck uh, and I thought would think oh you've not made an effort or what have you and it, it means a lot in a, it means a lot to younger athletes in a way you can't comprehend and now I'm, I'm older I'm aware of how it made me feel yeah. and I and I want to be as open book as I can to offer a help and advice and I and the problem is and athletes have to be trusted and feel confident in their own way of doing things and so I don't I'm very conscious of I don't want to, but this is how you should do it. Everyone has to create their own pathway and destiny. It's just, if people want to hear some advice of what I went through or did, great. If you don't, it's not a problem. It's just about being open enough to, to, to pass on. And as you say, Verity, I've tried to, to, to offer advice to, along with other athletes. If, and if, if it helps in some small way, then brilliant. Because I think, because like I say, it meant a lot to me when I was when I was coming yeah, through. And, yeah. um, Paula was fantastic for me growing up. Paula and Gary, they were both very. There's still things today that that I always remember that that little snippets, just one sentences, that meant a lot and have carried me through the sport. And and I know how one sentence can make a big distance coming from someone like that. Uh, and how much it can have, have an impact, and so I'm very aware of that. Just looking ahead then, finally, for me, ahead of the summer, what are your kind of planned expectations, thoughts Ooh. going into 2023? Yeah, I mean, we're, all, we're nearly halfway through the year. I know, it's Weird. scary, it's scary, it's scary, isn't it? It's scary, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, London was a bit of a, uh, as I say, stake in the sand for me to, to kind of use that as a tool to plan the rest of the year. I've had initial conversations with Alan, Story, my coach, and a few others to decide what to do. I, I think at this point, that there's, do I run another marathon or not? At the end of this year is a big question mark for me. Uh, I'm not 100% the answer. I, I, I genuinely. 50 50 whether i will or not i guess with berlin and seville and valencia you've got marathons there which are very yeah there quick. is i almost certainly wouldn't do berlin because it's i would need to start training for that probably fairly soon if i remember dates correctly and the other thing as well is there is the world road champion world road running yeah, no, Riga and Latvia, yeah. yeah so that's something that's on there that i like the look of but again qualifying for that's going to be tough so i think uh at the moment they're the two things in my mind weighing up um but I, I think I need to get the next, the, well, the last three weeks, I need to get the next couple of weeks out under my belt and then make a final decision and go for it. But either way, I want to spend June kind of training, but in a relaxed fashion without a big aim, just to reset the body and mind a bit, and then July kick on. So, but I do, like I say, the World Road Running Champions perk my attention and does another marathon or not, I'm not sure. But either way, um, I think what's really good is I'm in a position to really train and push on. That's the bit I've been trying to get to, and I needed this block to get myself in a position to kick on. I was about to say long-term ambitions, marathon for Paris potentially. That's the ultimate long-term goal. Yeah, I mean, there's the there's that, and there's obviously the Europeans. I mean, I have to be honest with myself. Like now we know the selection policy is almost certainly going to be you run to a low or you don't go. I've got to be honest with myself. That's a big step up for me. So. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I, I won't say what the answer was, but I did ask my coach bluntly, <laughs> can I run that or not? Uh, but it's, it's, if, yeah, I mean, it, I'm still processing London, I'm still processing the last three weeks, to be totally honest with, to be totally un know what I'm, what I'm thinking and yeah, feeling about yeah. that. But it is like you kind of. I've run, I needed London. And I've run to eleven fifty. To run to eight ten, it's a big jump. Um, there's things I can see how I, I, I. There's things that could have been better about it, and there's lots of little pieces. And you go, there's thirty seconds here. There's thirty seconds here. But can I find four minutes or whatever it is, three and a half minutes? It's, it's tough. So we'll see. I don't know. Um, but um, realistically, I think there probably would have to be other things in there, but I think the way that uh, policies have been written and the way that um, teams are selected now, it's, it's a different ball game now yeah. to what it used to yeah. be. It's not, 
it's not athlete friendly anymore. <laughs> it's, it really isn't. It's very much like save the pennies, don't take too many athletes, and I think that's that's kind of it's changed the landscape quite a bit. Yeah.